Well, hi there. I'm a shy, retiring kind of a clinical scientist kind of uh, person. My natural habitat is the university and uh, dreaming spires of Oxford. So I ask myself, what the heck am I doing here in Anaheim? <laughs> you see, what I do, I spend my time teaching, writing, running large-scale clinical trials, and publishing papers in high-impact medical journals. This is not the kind of work I normally do. But the reason why I'm here is that this seems to me and to most of my colleagues like one of the most critical opportunities to change public health that we have seen maybe in the last 50 years, maybe even this century. When I got the opportunity, when I was invited to come and talk here, I jumped at it. And every one of my colleagues would have done the same. Because when you take one of the most dynamic companies in corporate history and you add to that the most effective, the most therapeutic, potent beverage that we have in the entire functional food and beverage market, and you add to that the most intensively researched and most clinically proven and most effective natural ingredient to enhance immunity that we have ever come across, and you have a tool to change and improve public health, the likes of which we have never seen before. My friends, the next step change in improving American public health, and maybe world health if we get this right, is not happening in the wards and the laboratories of my hospital or my university. This is ground zero. This is truly the nutritional and public health equivalent of the Manhattan Project, and you are it. <clears throat> So what's the most important way, the most important thing that keeps you healthy? Well, it's not Medicare, and it is not the pharmaceutical industry. It's not even the pump action Remington in your gun rack. It's your immune system. And the reason why the immune system is so important is that you are constantly under attack by viruses and bacteria. You know, Howard Hughes was right, in a way, because every second of every day, you are all regardless of your levels of personal hygiene, just crawling with viruses and bacteria. I am too, we all are, that's the human condition. In fact, every single one of you carries on and inside your body more bacteria and more viruses than there are humans on the surface of this planet. And each and every one of them, the vast majority of them, is just waiting to get an opportunity to attack you and cause an infection. And the one thing that keeps you safe is your immune system. And it's working 60 seconds every minute, 24-7, to keep you healthy. And a lot of the time, it works OK. But every time the immune system is compromised or weakened by some external problem, one of those bacteria, one of those viruses might get through, and then you could be in very serious trouble. So what are the kinds of things that suppress the immune system? Well, malnutrition is one. You'd be surprised to hear this, but a lot of Americans and a lot of British people are malnourished. We eat enough food, but we eat the wrong kind of food. And if you're getting by on burgers, fries, and sodas, you're malnourished. So that's one problem right there. What are the other things that could affect you? Well, long-haul air travel. When you cross the Atlantic, you're exposed to the equivalent of four whole body x-rays. And everybody knows that knocks your immune system flat on its ass, which is why so many people, when they get off the plane, you end up with some sort of a respiratory tract infection or something worse. The third thing that reduces the efficiency of the immune system is stress. Now, I know that none of you are malnourished, none of you take long-distance air flights, and none of you know the meaning of the word stress, so I guess none of this applies to any of you. But what we do know when we look in detail at the immune systems of the general public, we find that in most cases they're not working as well as they should. In fact, this is a major factor which has contributed to the astonishing rise in allergies that we've seen since 1950, the huge increase in cancer, and it's the reason for our enormous vulnerability to infections when we travel. Now, infection has always been the leading cause of death to humans, until very recently.
And even Walt Disney knew this. And I'll explain why. Because in an age when people were still living crowded together in unsanitary conditions, infection was never very far away. You never knew when it was going to knock at your door, when it was going to come to your home, your family, and take away a parent, a partner, or a child in a matter of days. Scary stuff. And so what we do when we find things like this that are so frightening to us, so alien, we dress them up. That's what the function of folk tales is, fairy stories. Now, the original of this story, The Sleeping Beauty, the princess who pricks her thumb on a spindle, and she then falls into a sleep, into a deep sleep for a hundred years until the prince arrives and makes everything better. But you know what the original of that story is? The original of that story is not a princess, it's just someone, some girl, some boy, pricks their finger on a rose or a knife, a bacterium enters the blood, they develop septicemia, the bacteria runs right through their bodies. This girl, let's say it's a girl, over a period of four to five days, she falls into a coma, and then she dies. She doesn't wake up. There is no prince. This is what life used to be like. And of course, when infection came, very often it wasn't just affecting individuals, because you don't have to go back too far to go back to the time of the great epidemics, the great plagues. And I'm going to show you another cartoon now, which is a little more realistic. This is a medieval cartoon. What it shows you is something called the Dance of Death. A new bacterium comes to town. It hits target zero. The first person gets sick. They die. And before their body is cold in the ground, other people who have acquired the bacterium or the virus from this initial case are starting to die. So they're following him into the grave. These kinds of diseases wiped out entire communities, cities, families. The Black Death, for example, killed on average four or five out of every ten people. Grim times. But then, thanks to the work of scientists such as Louis Pasteur, the Frenchman, the Dutchman Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the German Robert Koch, we worked out that these kinds of diseases were not caused by evil spirits or miasmas, they were caused by bacteria. And then, thanks to human ingenuity, in historically what was the blink of an eye, we developed the antibiotics, which you all grew up with. Many of you have probably used at one time or another. And it looked as if we were winning the war against infection, we were pushing infection back into the corners. We were wrong. Turns out we were not winning the war. We won a couple of skirmishes, but we are losing the war, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a statement from the United States Centers for Disease Control, and they were saying back in 2005, many bacteria are becoming resistant to commonly used antibiotics worldwide. We have misused the antibiotics, and as a result, they are becoming next to useless. Just a few quick examples. This is something called MRSA, which means it's methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now, Staph aureus is a bug, lives on your skin, lives in your nose. When your defenses, your immune defenses, are not at their best, this bacterium can really hit you hard. It can kill you. Thirty years ago, not a problem. We had methicillin, we could cure every case. But now, what this graph is showing you is that in those countries marked red, over 50% of all cases of this particular bacterium are resistant, and they are becoming resistant to antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic. It's so serious now that some of my specialist colleagues, my medical microbiologist friends, when they get sick, if they require surgery, they say, don't take me to the hospital. I would rather be treated at home. Hospitals are just too dangerous. Bacteria become resistant, they travel around the world real fast. And this is a particular case, it was a consultant microbiologist who's a friend of mine. He picked up this particular resistant strain of pneumococcus, which is a bug that causes lung infections in Spain. And within 12 months, that same resistant bacterium had spread all around the world. It had become a global problem. We are losing the war, ladies and gentlemen. And the reason is, we're traveling too much. Air travel, large numbers of people jetting around from continent to continent, taking these dangerous, resistant strains of bacterium with them. And some of these bacterium 
some of them, they might not cause symptoms originally. So I could have gotten on a plane last night in Johannesburg or Berlin. I could have picked up a lethal new strain of plague, bacterium or virus. They're not going to pick that up at the customs, at the airport, because I don't yet have the symptoms. But I might be coughing up that bacterium right now. I could be infecting this entire auditorium. You don't know. That's the worst case. I can assure you I'm healthy. <laughs> I'm not bringing you the plague. Not today, anyway. But we are very, very vulnerable. And we are vulnerable in a way that we have never been before because of this kind of mass transit. And it's not just people. The mass transit of goods. Food, for example. This is a typical shopping basket. And when you actually analyze where these different foods come from, they're coming from all over the world, from parts of the world where sanitation is not necessarily as good as it is here, where antibiotics are misused. You are bringing all kinds of unwanted microbiological visitors into your home every day, every day you go to the store. You can't close the borders to these kinds of problems. They affect all of us. Just to make life a little more interesting, I don't know if any of you know this, but two weeks ago, the Environmental Protection Agency issued a statement about a new and exciting group of infections which are called zoonotic diseases. Now, I'm sorry about the terminology. All that means is these are diseases that we acquire from animals, and malaria is one. But since 1960, we have seen 400 new diseases entering human clinical medicine. So, for example, HIV. That didn't exist before 1965. SARS, which you may remember, it blew out, but we'd never seen SARS before. Bird flu and swine flu, new diseases. Hantavirus, West Nile virus, and in fact, since 1990, we have seen, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Since 1990, we have seen, seen over 40 new diseases emerging. And the reason for this is increasing numbers of people, increased urbanization. Large numbers of people moving into parts of the world where we haven't lived before and coming into contact with new animal species. Coupled with climate shift, coupled with increased human transit. These diseases are entering the human population in a way that we have not seen before. We have no defenses against them because our antibiotics are beginning to give up the ghost. This is a guy called George Post. He's a professor at the unit of biodesign at the University of Arizona, a very senior microbiologist. And this is a statement he issued in 2005. The age of infection control is coming to an end. By 2010, antibiotics will be effectively useless. Uh, in case you hadn't noticed, this is 2010. And this is more or less where we are. George was right. So how did we ever survive? How do the species survive? Well, if you have a good immune system, that will keep you safe most of the time. And this is a picture of Kalahari Bushmen. They're standing in here for early man. I don't know if you've noticed, but the gentleman with the bow and arrow on the right is actually an example of early Marlboro man because he's smoking what looks like a very primitive cigarette. But you can look in more detail at what it is that's keeping him healthy. And it's something that we now understand is the innate immune system. This is not the fancy part of the immune system that you can manipulate through vaccines. It's a very basic, fundamental part of the immune system, and it consists of external barriers, such as the skin, which is very well designed to keep infectious agents out, internal barriers. If you've ever wondered why you have acid in your stomach, it's because a lot of the food that we used to eat was always contaminated with bacteria. When you eat food, it falls into the acid bath of your stomach, and that kills most microorganisms. That's why we're designed that way. And then you have a very interesting and very aggressive population of immune cells which roam around your body looking for anything that doesn't belong there, a bacterium or a virus, and they are designed to seek and kill, to hunt it down and to destroy it. And they look like this. This is a macrophage running around the body looking for bacteria and eating them as soon as it finds them. A neutrophil doing the same thing. Looks like Star Wars. These are very aggressive cells that are constantly working on your behalf to keep you healthy. It's extremely effective. Oh, I'm sorry about this. It's extremely effective unless it's compromised. It's compromised by the things that I told you about, by stress, by malnutrition. 
But very recently, in the last decade or so, we have come to understand that the immune system is absolutely dependent. It's so used to the presence of yeasts in the environment, it has become dependent on them. It depends on the presence of beta-glucans in your diet from yeast to work properly. Now, we always used to eat a lot of these compounds because they were in bread and in beer, and they were present throughout the food chain. But the food chain has changed. The bread and the beer that we consume these days has almost no yeast left in it. And because we use fungicides and we've sterilized the food chain, all these beta-glucans have gone, and our immune system, as a result, is falling down on the job. It's making us more vulnerable than we have ever been before. If, that is, you live in Anaheim, or Salt Lake City, or London, or any one of the great developed cities. Now, in parts of the world where the environment is not as effectively over-sanitized, people are consuming beta-glucans in their diet naturally as a result of contamination, and they live in conditions which would kill you. But because their immune systems are so strong, because of these beta-glucans, they don't get infected. This is in northern Turkey, this is in Kinshasa, and this is in Udaipur, and right behind me there were elephants and bullocks walking past, and the street was a mess. People are preparing, storing, eating their food in these conditions, and they don't get sick because they have strong immune systems. If you tried that, you'd be in hospital the next day. We over-sanitized our environment, folks. We sterilized the food chain, and we turned our kitchens into operating theaters. We made them so clean, we took away the beta-glucans, and as a result, we left ourselves defenseless. What we are effectively doing is putting the beta-glucans back into the food chain. We are restoring normal function, restoring the immune system to the levels that it was always designed to work at. This is what the beta-glucans look like that we're putting into immune. It's a long, long molecule. If it was on this scale, the other end of this molecule would be in New York. Very long, very complex molecule. How does it work? Well, if a bacterium gains entry into your body, the first thing that happens is a couple of chemicals in the body react to it, they bind to it, and they create a complex. And what this does is it attracts the immune cells. So the immune cells come running. This is a macrophage or a neutrophil. And this is what your immune systems look like. Under these conditions, they will do a reasonable job at killing off the bacteria. But they're not that effective. Your defenses are not working as they should be. You are vulnerable. Because there is another receptor on these cells which responds specifically to Wellmune, to beta-glucans. And it is only when both receptors are occupied that you get the killing of the bacterium. It is now, in this condition, you're safe. How safe are you? Oh, okay. How safe are you? You are very safe. This is a study that we did with weaponized anthrax. Now, this is something that you won't hear the people at Esther C or Airborne talking about because that's crap. That's just smoke and mirrors. This is the real deal. <clears throat> there is only one key to the immune system, and you have it. You have it in this new immune product. And it is so effective. It is so effective. We did this study with weaponized anthrax. You can't do this in an ordinary laboratory. We had to do this in conjunction with the Defense Department of Canada back in 2002. You need very, very special conditions, laboratories, to do this kind of work. Because anthrax kills. And you can see here in the graph, the blue line shows that if you give the animals the anthrax bacillum, Basically, after five or six days, they start dying. They start dying in large numbers. But if you give them a little of the Wellmune beta-glucan at only two milligrams per kilogram, which, by the way, is the level of beta-glucan that you have in immune, no deaths at all. Now, I'm not saying that you should be drinking immune to protect you against weaponized anthrax or biological weapons. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm simply using this as an example to show you how incredibly powerful this defense system is. The scientists in the Department of Defense had never seen anything like this. We can't compare this to anything. It's unprecedented. Nothing else works like this. And folks, you now have access to this. <laughs> Thank you.
This is an FDA phase two clinical trial. I'm sorry about the graphs. I'm going to keep the numbers and the science down to a minimum. But there are certain types of surgeries where after surgery, there is a high frequency of infection. That's bad news because it means people are stuck in hospital, people die, lawsuits, all those kinds of problems. And you can see here that as you give these people larger doses of beta-glucans, of Wellmune, the incidence of postoperative infection goes down and down and down until when you get to about one to two milligrams a kilogram, no infections. We're saving lives here in one of the most difficult environments. And let me just say again, nothing else does this. Nothing. Okay, influenza, that's been topical lately. Whether you believe it's here to stay or whether it's going to get worse or not, that's a moot point. But this is another animal model where we were exposing rats to a high dose of influenza virus, and you can see it's a dose high enough to kill all of them. They're all dead by day nine. If you give them beta-glucans, if you give them Wellmune, you save 50% of them. Well, we're not saving all of them. But what that means is, if I were to give this community Wellmune, if you were drinking Wellmune and you're immune and a really bad flu virus came to town, other communities would be devastated. You would be almost entirely safe. And I'm telling you this as an independent scientist. And your families would be safe. And if enough people in your community were taking beta-glucan in immune or in any other form, the virus would not be able to take hold in your community. You could protect entire nations in this way. Again, nothing else will do this. Let me put your feet back on the ground now and talk about just a handful of studies that Wellmune has carried out over the last few years. This is a human cold and flu study we were studying healthy, community-dwelling subjects. The trial was very robust. All the bells and the whistles that you look for, double-blind, placebo-controlled, and they were given either Wellmune, WGP, or placebo for a period of 90 days. And when you look at the results, I'm sorry about all the figures. I'm going to lose the unnecessary stuff. I'm going to simplify this. Basically, what you can see here is that in the Wellmune group, the number of days missed from work or from school was zero. 100% protection, whereas in the placebo group, you had a small but significant number of people who were so ill that they were losing days from work or from school. Wellmune does the trick here. And when you look at the incidence of fever, 3.5 days of fever in the placebo group, zero. Zero in the Wellmune group. Study number two, lifestyle stress. Here it's 150 subjects, moderate to high lifestyle stress, the kinds of stresses that probably many of you are exposed to. Double-blinded, placebo-controlled, they're given Wellmune WGP or placebo for four weeks. And again, a little complex, so let me talk you through this. If you look at the subjects who are reporting ERTI symptoms, these are the symptoms of a respiratory tract infection, the placebo group are in blue. And you can see that at week two, there is 16 of those in the placebo group and only four in the Wellmune group. By week four, that pattern is maintained. So there is protection against developing these symptoms, which is maintained throughout the trial. And it's important to reiterate what Jeff was saying. These people were taking Wellmune on a daily basis because you need to feed the immune cells on a daily basis. They don't last for long. They're just around for a couple of days. Each new generation has to be primed in exactly the same way. Stress study number two, marathoners. These are people who are running the Carlsbad Marathon. 75 subjects, again, double-blinded, placebo-controlled. They're given Wellmune WGP, or placebo, for four weeks. And the same sort of pattern emerges. This is consistent, folks. In study after study, we are seeing the same high level of protection. So the subjects reporting the symptoms of coughs and colds and flu, 16 in the placebo group, less than half of that in the Wellmune group. And after week four, the level of protection is even better. It works every time in study after study after study. And of course, if you're getting less symptoms of respiratory tract infections, you feel better. You have more energy. You just feel good about yourself. And when you do your self-reported health scores, once again, the 
subjects who are taking Wellmu and WGP just report consistently and study after study, they feel better. They have more energy, they're more functional. Study number three, firefighters. And interestingly, this particular study was co-funded by the US Air Force. And the reason for that is that these are not just your ordinary run-of-the-mill firefighting heroes. These are what they call smoke jumpers. These are folk who, when there are wildfires, and I understand that you have these every now and then in California, these folk are stepped into a helicopter and they are dropped behind the flames. And this is very, very stressful. They're working in dangerous, difficult atmospheres. And the reason why the US Air Force is interested is because this reproduces, in many respects, combat conditions. And when we look at the results, we found that Wellmune WGP reduced the symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection by about a quarter, dramatically improved overall physical health, importantly increased wellness and work output. Whether you're a firefighter or a Marine comes to the same thing. This is significant, wildly significant. So let me summarize, I don't wish to run over. This is all natural immune enhancement. You are restoring normality with this amazing new extension to your range of products. Safety, it has FDA grass approval. It's recommended for daily use. We know exactly how it works. It's proven, it's attested. It has a unique proprietary structure. We have an awful lot of human clinical research studies. In fact, over 1,000 publications on this molecule alone, making it the most intensively studied natural ingredient ever. This is, I'll go back to the point I made at the beginning. What this tells us is infectious diseases of one sort or another are becoming more of a threat to us than they have been in my lifetime or in yours. The drugs don't work. Vaccines are never going to be ready in time, particularly for diseases we don't even know which ones are going to affect us next. The only defense we have is improved immunity. And the only way we know how to achieve that is with beta-glucans, with Wellmune WGP. So this is a therapeutic and a public health tool we've never seen before. It has the potential to radically improve public health, as I said, first in North America, subsequently world health, and this tool is now in your hands. So that's a heavy responsibility, but it is also, I think, a very significant marketing opportunity. Now, I, I wish I could do some questions and answers. I don't have time to do that, and I've only given you a very top-level review of some of the work that's being done here. I'll be happy to serve you in any way that I can. Thank you.